So I'll start. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are so excited to have you here on Saturday. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Claudia Bertoloni Smith, and I have lots of years of teaching experience teaching in the classroom. I taught in Seattle for 10 years, and then I, I taught in Douglas County, Nevada, just down the way um, for 17. And for 10 of those years, I was lucky enough to co-teach with Marlene in the classroom. And we're what we're presenting today is something that we created while we were in the classroom co-teaching together. It's been incredibly effective and kind of a game changer for both of us in terms of how we teach and what we think um, is important when we're working with students. Students. Currently, I'm an assistant professor at Chico State University. I got my PhD at UNR. Um, Heather um, was one of my co-students, <laughs> um, so it's really wonderful to be presenting with you today. Marlene. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, and thanks for being here. I am a teacher at a middle school in South, at the middle school in South Lake Tahoe. I teach seventh grade English. It's my 21st year. Um, I love teaching at the middle school level. It's super challenging and interesting. Um, and again, Claudia said the root of this all started about 15 years ago when we taught together, um, a little bit more than that. So we've been developing this approach to dealing with difficult behavior in the classroom um, for the last 15 years. Um, we've been fortunate enough to roll it out at my school in its entirety. We have um, the program in seven schools. Um, elementary all the way through high school and uh, we're in the middle of writing a book about it so we're super excited about this content we both feel really passionate about it and um, I'm I, I use it every single minute of the day in uh, with my seventh grade students so super happy to be here and thank you so much yeah and we'd love to know a little bit about you could you just put in the chat maybe what grade level you teach or if you're administration or you work in higher ed we'd love to know from you who we have here so everybody if you could put that in the chat if you have chat available to you right now that'd be great okay great fifth grade first grade literacy yeah science nice so a behavior specialist hi high school algebra three through five Great, great. Chemistry, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. It's really wonderful. We have a really great mix of all sorts of different folks here with us today, and we are excited um, to share with you um, our work. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, we just want to welcome you again. And we want to talk about what we're um, calling tools, not roles. And um, what it's all about is helping students become serious, assertive, and working in your classroom. And we introduce ourselves. Um, so here's our agenda for today. We'd love for you to walk away knowing kind of what is Tools Not Rules, what are the basics of it. We'd like you to be able to implement some of the stuff on Monday if, if, the, if something calls to you. Um, we want you to know how the specific language of Tools Not Rules is used in a classroom and how um, you can use it too. It's, it's really easy to do. Um, we also want you to know how teachers help their students understand the language because as we speak, you'll see that there is a common set of language that we use with the students and that's really helpful. And then we have to help our students understand what that means. And if we have time, we don't know, we did a really great study in the middle school that Marlene teaches at, and we got some pretty interesting results from students, teachers, and administration, and we can share some of those results with you if we have time. So let's get started. So what is Tools Not Rules? So Tools Not Rules is just based on the premise that behavior is going to happen in the classroom. It's just going to happen. We can't be surprised. And I know every year that I taught in the classroom, I thought I've seen it all. But then the next year, there's, oh my gosh, saw something more. So we just know as teachers, we can't be surprised. Tools Not Rules is a way for teachers to deal with all those things that come up without an emotional reaction from us. Instead, with curiosity and care, we have our students in the classroom, they're showing us their behaviors and they're trying to tell us something. And so when we approach it with curiosity and care, it tends to go really well. So um, when we use tools, not roles in the classroom, uh, Marlene and I and Marlene in the classroom and even me with the university students, I'm no longer delivering a lecture um, on what they did 
Instead, we're helping students assess them, the behavior themselves, and we're helping them choose a different behavior. And it works because we remove shame from the interaction. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And one of the key cornerstones of Tools Not Rules is helping students understand that honesty is a powerful tool to making any change in your life. We have to be honest before we can really see what's happening and then we can really deal what's really there, deal with what's really there. And um, so we want to propose that we have the same behaviors, we just get different outcomes. And it's it's pretty wonderful working with students in this way. So that's that in a nutshell, that's what Tools Not Rules is. Um, we told you a little bit about where it came from, but I just want to add a little more. It, this It has its origins when we were teaching math together in um, our fifth and sixth grade classroom, and we saw so many behaviors. And maybe if you teach the sciences or something that's pretty difficult, um, more behaviors from students come out, especially resistant behaviors and um, different ways of avoiding the work or not doing the work or not engaging in the lesson or not paying attention to the lesson. And Marlene and I were just like, this is driving us crazy. We have to figure out something to do. Like it's way too important. We can't let these students use this behavior to avoid learning. Um, and so after um, trying our first triad, you can see on the screen, um, shirking, working, showboating, after figuring um, that one out, and we'll tell you what those mean in, in a minute, um, we started using with students and never looked back. And we had tremendous results. Marlene, do you want to add anything? No, I think you got it. It's awesome. Thanks. Got it. So there it is. Kind of just a little backstory. It comes from years and years in the classroom, fine tuning, figuring it out um, and working on this idea of tools, not rules. OK, so we want to go to um, using the language in the classroom. So we want you to know it's not hard to get tools and rules up and running in your classroom. You see these posters here. We have these printed versions. You don't even need printed versions. You could make them yourself. Um, but once, in the, once, once it's up and running and the students know the language and you're committed to using the language and using the approach, it's always operating in the classroom and it becomes uh, used every day to motivate and coach your students to becoming serious, assertive and working. And again, um, just to reiterate, our goal um, of tool, Tools Not Rules was to help our students and, and it started in math and then it went to everything we did all day. We wanted them, instead of shirking, avoiding the work and instead of showboating, um, we wanted them working. Instead of being really passive and not asking questions or you know losing all their things or, or being aggressive, moving more towards anger, we wanted them to be assertive. And instead of being stuck and not able to understand or move forward or just getting silly and sarcastic during our class time, we wanted them to get serious. And so you can see um, uh, in these language triads where we're constantly coaching them too. And again, what I said at the beginning is students are going to come in with all sorts of behavior. And Marlene and I found that their behaviors pretty much fit into these three triads of words. Um, so once we had these set, it was pretty great because we could um, use them consistently and with a lot of success. Okay, ready? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so we, um, uh, when I moved to a different middle school, uh, Teachers started coming in my classroom saying, what are you doing? Why is it working? Why are kids happier in your classroom? You teach the same students. What's happening? So I had all these posters handwritten. Um, our principal, I presented to my staff and the principal said, I think we need this whole school. So that was the beginning of a larger rollout, which was really exciting. Um, so we created this idea that a lot of times we post a lot of classroom rules and uh, I found those weren't always effective after the first week. I never knew what to do because it wasn't working. So we decided we are going to call these um, tools instead of rules. And, um, and we find that these fit beautifully with no matter what system you're using. Um, if you're doing some PBIS stuff or if you have other programs happening in your school, um, this is kind of the action oriented language that helps deliver any uh, goals and objectives you have as a classroom and as a school. So um, this is the cornerstone and here's what happens. There is nothing fancy about these posters other than it gives kids language. 
But here's the fanciest thing. It's this poster right here. I think we often ask kids to be honest. Hey, I want you to be honest. Tell me. But then we go into this lecture kind of quality with them and they feel some degree of shame or cut off um, from you. And so when you when you start this or if you do anything, let's say you only take this poster into your classroom. This is the essential piece that makes kids feel safe to tell the truth. And anytime I get honesty out of a kid, I immediately thank them. Now I'm not particularly impressed with the behavior or happy with what I've seen, but they know I want the truth. Tell me what happened, explain that to me. And then as soon as it comes out of their mouth, I feel this tremendous relief. And when I thank them for honesty, I'm not being snarky. I'm literally saying, oh, thank goodness. Thank you for telling me the truth. Now we can work on something. Now we can shift something. So um, this piece is a tricky piece because I think there's not a teacher in here that would say, well, I don't, I, I've always asked my students to be honest, or I've always wanted them to be honest, but it's the quality in which we approach this that is kind of the, uh, the kind of the, the linchpin on the way this whole program works. And so whatever we say today, you might be interested in trying tools, not rules, but if you can create an environment in a classroom where kids know they can say the truth and you're not going to launch into a lecture, you're not going to launch into some big fancy uh, kind of uh, shame oriented uh, kind of operation on them. They'll tell you the truth and then you can work with them. We love this. And this, this piece is really important. Yeah, and I know that I just want to add, Marlene does a beautiful job. I mean, she gets kids to tell her all sorts of like information about what really happens. And the first thing so sincere comes out of her mouth is that takes a lot of courage to be honest. Thank you so much. So in the moment when a child is admitting they did something really wrong, they're being coached that telling the truth was courageous and it was the great thing to do. And now we're moving on from here. So um, again, if you don't take anything, you just take this piece. We, um, we acknowledge how important it is. All right, so these were the first words that uh, Claudia's, uh, I love Claudia's brain. And, and if you've ever been in an amazing co-teaching uh, cl classroom or environment, uh, you know, it kind of explodes both your talents. Well, Claudia is one of her gifts is she is really good at thinking outside of the box. And there was this moment where she just came back, she put it all together. And um, we really feel like we love our kids, but we don't like the behavior. So it was this breakthrough moment. And I feel like this is one of those kind of leaps that she was able to make that uh, the kids are not their behavior but they have tons of bad behavior. And uh, really it, the origins of it were, were with her son. I was teaching her son and I said, uh, Evie's driving me insane, Claudia, because we got really honest when we didn't like our kids or when they were driving us crazy because kids know it. And so the sooner we can get really clear and honest about that, the sooner we can help them without them kind of internalizing all that weird mucky stuff that teachers can give us, even though they're not being direct about it. So Claudia came up with this. At first they were they were nouns, uh, shirkers, workers, and showboaters, but we realized quickly that we all have these bad behaviors at times. We all can be working, but there's times when I'm shirking. There's times when I'm showboating and I tend to go towards the orange words versus the blue words. And you'll notice we're trying to get kids into the green zone. And there's lots of um, research around kind of getting um, a quality of color around uh, behavior things. There's lots of um, psychologists and things that are using those types of words with colors. So um, the shirking is that kind of passive um, quality that we have in blue. The showboating is orange, a little bit more of a kind of a louder quality. Um, I tend towards the orange words. Um, and some people tend towards the blue words, but we all can be in all of them at all times. So that was kind of the breakthrough moment that we got together and did um, in elementary school. Then we both moved to a middle school and we were teaching separately. She was teaching math. I was teaching English and social studies. And Claudia quickly realized that in math, when it gets hard, um, kids, some kids get serious and are, can raise their hand and say, hey, I need help. Uh, some kids just get stuck and kind of melt into their chair and go kind of catatonic. And then some go silly. They just want to make a laugh about everything. And, um, and we all can do this. See, we think this language isn't just helpful for children. We think this, this language, uh, we can coach them to higher levels. I also, I know there's a lot of high school teachers here, and we just want to point out, we have a set of posters for high school um, and we changed this one word silly to sarcastic because we realized this um, 
uh, is not doesn't quite fit the um, audience. Uh, and then we have a more sophisticated look. So you know, if you make your own posters, you could you could um, you know substitute in sarcastic, or if you think of another S word that can be helpful there, kind of one of those more aggressive uh, kind of um, yeah, one of those more aggressive kind of focused words. All right, so I also kind of when I when we move to the middle school, aggressive behavior is much more prevalent. You feel it, and I know in the upper grades and elementary you do, and definitely at the high school level. So we added these three, um, and we really spent a lot of time on this idea that when you are assertive, you're saying I matter. Assertive is raising your hand, saying, "Hey, I don't have those papers." Um, it's not passive aggressive going, "Hey, you didn't give me the papers, right?" So it is um, that really. Um, that that idea that you matter in this classroom and you're the one who has to let me know that and we're constantly coaching kids towards that just yesterday i had to coach someone who's being very passive um i had him try the whole situation again hey could you raise your hand and then i compliment him. great job being assertive tell me what it is you need uh, aggressive is amazing when you are up against it because that's something that can really throw a lot of us off when we're in the middle of aggressive behavior and i am telling you it is unbelievable when you can get those kids to I say where are you operating from because you never identify it for the kids you let them identify it and they say I spend most of my time aggressive and showboating and you're like hallelujah oh my gosh you're right that is where you are I'm so impressed you know that and just that in and of itself helps take everyone down three notches and creates a, a more open honest relationship um, that you can just take so much farther so much more quickly Awesome. Okay. So um, we kind of wanted to show you what a cycle looks like in talking with um, a student and how you use tools, not rules language to quickly help them adjust. And so we kind of think this hits on that self-assessment and self-regulation that's so important. Sometimes people call this self-management. Um, so um, we all know the students are going to get disengaged. So like it starts there and, and it could be loud disengagement, aggressive disengagement. It could be um, less, um, more passive disengagement. And then we quickly bring them to self-assess with the tools, not rules language. And that's why they're posted in our classroom. So we can ask the students, take a look and tell us where you're operating from. And because we've told them how important honesty is, they're just honest. You know, they'll, they'll say, um, I'm feeling really... Um, I'm feeling really stuck and um, a little bit, um, I'm feeling a little bit like I'm being, sh I'm shirking right now. So you get them to use the tools, tools, not rules language. And it's great because we don't have to come up with a name for it because in moments when we're not feeling great about what students are doing, we might think of a name like lazy, which is really shame and Dixina. And so we let them do it and it, um, and then they know, okay. And then you say, thank you so much for being honest. And that is allowing the honesty and without shame and without a reaction. Um, then we move into the self-management phase. So what can we do to help you? How can we get you to move from shirking to working? What would be helpful for you right now? And, and this whole discussion takes two to three minutes. Um, well, I guess, you know, if I had a pencil, I could do my stuff. Great. I'm going to get you a pencil. Do you have the worksheet? No, I actually don't have that. I'm going to give you an extra copy of that. And we're just going to move right into the classroom, get the pencil, get the worksheet, sit them down. And here's the other piece of the cycle that is so important. Um, this piece here, notice any micro adjustments that the student makes. And um, this could be on a personal level. If you have older students, um, it can be more, you know, um, public if you're in, with younger students. But if that student picks up their pencil and starts working on their paper, then there is a, there is praise that might sound like this. I noticed that you've gotten started on your paper. That is really serious and working behavior. And I want to thank you for that. And then you just walk away. Um, so they know that they've made this first step towards the working behavior and it was noticed. And often these students that do this often and are always constantly engaging in that, they are seen as a student who doesn't work. But if you take the time to have this conversation and then notice when they change, it can bring about amazing things. 
right? So that's one of the circles. Um, so the thing about tools, not rules is we're approaching students with curiosity and it is really novel to them. They are so used to the lecture. They're so used to the shouting. They're so used to being sent to the office. Um, these kids, they get really good at it. But when we approach with curiosity um, and it's novel and they look at you like, what, what did you just ask me? And it helps us avoid um, shaming students for their behavior, because we really strongly agree that children are not their behavior. Their behavior is a communication that is not well done if it's if it's poor behavior. They, they're trying to tell us something. Um, so we approach it with curiosity. Like, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Um, and they're more likely to be honest, too. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Um, it's, it's really true. Curiosity. Curiosity. Like, mm, this is really interesting. Tell me about it. Um, Okay, so we just want to say a little bit about shame. Um, we've worked with a lot of students and um, we are people too. I, I just want to say we are humans. Teachers are humans. We have great days and we have really hard days. Um, and this, per, this approach that we created was to keep us away from um, shaming students because we in no way wanted that to be what we do, but we also recognize that sometimes we'd slip into it and we didn't like the outcome. So just remember that shame has a high cost. Um, when, when students are shamed, they believe they are unworthy of connection. And there's so much research out there that says, if you make a connection with the student, they will learn from you. You break the connection, they disconnect from you, they disconnect from your class, and they disconnect from the content you are teaching. And I do a lot of research in math education. And um, my students who are in the credential program wanting to become teachers hate math because the teacher shamed them and they hate the content. Um, and I'm like, that's interesting. That's how powerful we are when we um, when we choose what that shame can be. Um, so because of the time, I think I'm going to skip this. Is that OK, Mar? Yeah. OK. All right. So um, just just to help us think about it. And when we remove shame and this is from Brene Brown, who's wonderful, um, and she talks a lot about this, did a lot of research around this shame erod erodes accountability um, and it, it, it kind of stops students from being honest. And shame says you are bad, like your whole being is bad. But accountability says I did something bad. And that's where they can be a little bit more honest. And we can remove shame. We can get that um, accountability. And we can also get the honesty from the students. And, and it frees them from the burden of feeling like they're a bad person. Okay, so we'd just like you to reflect. Um, recall a time when you or someone else was shamed by a teacher or administrator. What was the situation? Could you write that in the chat? And we're challenging you to use five words or less. What happened? Hmm. Oh, oh so you, you just feel this, don't you? When you read those, it just like oh. puts you in the stomach. We've all been there. Mm. Didn't understand something. Be mm -hmm. Can you imagine being shamed because you didn't understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hated PE. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Even adults. Um, Shame. I'm just looking at the one about the admin who chose that path. Yeah, that that's that's around for sure. You see that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, then I, I want to just pop in here around this. Like, uh, it's not that I don't shame kids still. I need you to know I get this wrong sometimes and I can feel it in my body, but it's our job to really tune into ourselves and think, uh that was the wrong thing to do. I got it wrong. And when, when we get it wrong, those kids will disconnect from us. And, um, 
and they can't learn and um and we we kind of fail them in some way so it is really important when we do that we gotta uh kind of come up to them and say hey i got that wrong but here's how i'm feeling about this this is what i need to do instead so we don't expect anyone to be perfect this is something we all have to kind of work our way out of because this is how we saw what we saw modeled just by your all of your examples so super important there just to pay attention to that piece that it's something we can do doesn't mean we're bad we just got to feel it and we got to own it. Yeah. And um, Liza is saying, I'm not perfect. <laughs> None of us are. None of us are. But but when you have honesty, you can say, I just want to be honest with you. Um, this is what happened and I'm sorry. So it's great. Okay. It was that middle school teacher in me. <laughs> now I teach elementary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay, do you want me to pop in on this, Claudia? Is this mine? Yeah, yeah, that, that's yours. Thank you. So, um, so when shame is removed, um, we give them the opportunity to self-regulate um, and self-assess because they think you want the truth and they actually know what's going on if they realize they don't have to lie because you're not going to disconnect from them. They're trying to stay connected. They're trying to stay out of trouble. And when they realize that you're going to hold them accountable, but not disconnect from them, it's really powerful. So we can do this as a whole group. We can do it individually. Um, so um, a lot of times when I feel like things are getting out of control in my classroom and I feel like I can't rein it in with one or two kids, I, um, I'll say, everyone stop. Everyone take a look at the wall. Uh, everyone point to a talking partner. Tell your neighbor where you're operating from right now or what's happening for you. I don't care if they're honest or if they're if they nailed it or if they're not. I just care that they're talking about it and they say it. Most of them are really willing to say I'm being serious or I'm being silly. And then I just say, everyone take a look. Where do you need to move to? They all choose a different word. And I say, we're back together in five, four, three, two, one. And then it just happens. And so I'm not checking in. I'm not making sure they're telling the truth about it. I just get that to happen. And then it works. It just, they all are like, oh, she's with us. She's paying attention. She wants us to, to get back with her. So we can do it as a whole group really easily. Individually, um, you know, you can whisper, go to the wall, especially if they need a walking break, go to the wall, come back, tell me what's happening. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks for the truth. You got that. Great. What do you need to do to get back into serious, assertive and working? Um, I need a mentor. I need uh, a piece of paper. Awesome. You knew it. And so what that also does, does is it, it actually cues me up for a positive engagement. So I, I don't get into the negative behavior discussion at all. I'm neutral, completely neutral, because I've had bad behavior. They have bad behavior. I'm neutral. You have this really straight poker face about it, even if it's something that you're like, oh, my goodness. Um, and then you have them, then they come to you, and now all of a sudden they said something truthful, and all of a sudden I'm cued for a positive engagement. I'm, a, I'm, I'm cued to say, that was honest, nice work. And I actually generally feel it inside my body. Like, it really makes me a happier teacher. Uh, and then you might say, um, yeah, so Claudia is going to pop into this on the magic fuzzy numbers. This is, if you take nothing away, take away honesty, try to create a climate of honesty and do this. This is magic. Go ahead, Claudia. And we have to say, we don't know why it works, but it works. It works on everybody. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, what, and this is good for our teaching soul. So what this is, is noticing in mathematical terms, because we all love math, what is going right? And we label it with numbers. So, um, so for example, when you see serious assertive working, um, you give them a realistic value. 80% of us have our paper out and a pencil and we're looking up here, that is awesome, we're ready to go. We're only waiting for 20%. Um, so I can cue the class that way. And then sometimes, um, uh, I'll say 80% are, oh, and now it's 90. Oh my gosh, now it's 95. It is 100. You are amazing. You are serious assertive workers. Um, and so that's the way you use those. You can do fractions. If you have table groups at your class, you know, because here's the classic, you're walking around, five people in the table group are ready, one person's not, and you're having the conversation with the one student who's not. So instead, I'll walk by and say, five out of six of you are ready, and that's amazing. Thank you for being ready. And then I'll go to the next group. And um, so I'm just trying to tell myself and reinforce the students who are participating. And I'm thinking five out of six, that's five, six, that's pretty good. And then it just helps the one student know and they wonder who wasn't. 
who wasn't doing it? And then it just, it, it, it helps them understand that a hundred percent of us need to be ready to go because this teacher is really serious about us learning. Um, okay. Here's the one that is so good for my teaching health. I stopped calling kids names. I stopped um, always saying, you know, the one name that you say over and over all day because it's the one student who is not ever participating, always off. So I'm not saying names anymore. I'm just talking about the percentage, the fraction, the decimal, the average of the students who are engaging in the way in which I want them to engage. So um, that was really helpful. And it increases engagement quickly, really quickly, because you start counting those numbers. Like I've got 80, I've got 90, 95, 100%, nice job. Um, and you can apply the praise afterwards. So if you want to say you're coaching the students to be more serious about their work, you can say um, during the work time, 95% of us are really focusing on their reading. And I also see people taking notes and that's what we are supposed to do. That's what serious working looks like. And so it just gives you that opportunity to praise them in the moment for the behavior that they are doing and tie it to that idea that they're working. And that's a piece of this coaching approach. Claudia, can I say a little something really quickly about that one? Yeah. I just want to say uh, there's a couple important things about um, the magic fuzzy numbers. Um, number one is um, we set our highest students up for failure. And you know this through Carol Dweck's work out of Stanford um, about praise and how we praise. Um, when we like have that cupcake status in class, like, oh, thank you, Claudia, for having all your things out. And what that does is that sets Claudia up. Um, to cheat more, to lie more, because they're so concerned about needing to be perfect in that fixed um, mindset about who they are. So I want to say this system we don't think is just effective for your kids that are struggling. We think it's effective to kind of rid a lot of our kids of that fixed mentality that keeps some of our highest kids from uh, uh, quitting when things get hard, um, for feeling like they need to lie or cheat in order to kind of maintain that status. So uh, we love it for that also. So thank you, Claudia. Yeah, so it's great. That's one thing you can try on Monday. Just try it and see what happens. Yes. <laughs> um, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun to do too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and the one other thing I want to say is most kids know that teachers start after after they have eighty percent of the kids, and we don't ever do that. And if you have one holdout, like the one kid who's just grumping on you or being stubborn, just make a note of it. Don't stand there and start having a fight about that. I have eighty nine percent, and I am waiting for two. You know, if you kind of do that, it kind of ruins the magic. But you can then go, oh, I'm going to have a tools not rules conversation with those two out in the hall separately and figure out what's going on with them. And then again, you can kind of handle it. That way. All right. Um, thanks, Claudia, for that. It's just a, yeah. such an exciting strategy that um, it really is worth its time in terms, terms of use. Um, okay. I wanted to share a couple situations that happen. I, am, I just finished my second year of, um, sorry, excuse me, my second week, my 21st year of teaching, but my second week um, of seventh grade English. And I've already, um, you know how it is. I think you guys are probably in your third week or maybe your fourth week or maybe your second week also, but you kind of figure out who your heavy hitters are in your class those first couple of weeks. It's like uh, kind of watching the big popcorns pop to the top and you're like, oh yeah, this is where I'm going to spend some time. So trying to help certain kids. So I want to share two situations that I was sharing with Claudia this morning when we are kind of fine tuning this um, to just kind of show you and maybe think about some of these things, maybe kind of read the screen and kind of see um, where maybe I use some of those. So what's important for you to realize is there's not a behavior situation ever anymore that I don't approach it with this operating in the background all the time, because I, I know what to do. I know how to handle it. I know that I'm going to create an honest conversation. I know I'm going to create a connection with the kid and I'm going to be able to do something a little bit better than I'm currently doing. Um, what you need to know about me is I move to um, those orange words fast. I move to aggression. I move. It, that's kind of my natural tendency. I kind of I um, I play it hot. Um, and so what that what tools not rules does is allows me to pull back a little. I still get into my like, hey, don't, you're not messing with my classroom in this way. This is not happening this way. But I then move into connection. So I'm going to share two situations, and um, I'm not going to use their real names, of course. But um, these are the real situations, and they are fresh for me. So. I want to tell you about Cami. Cami um, 
ruined some sixth grade teachers' years. I had some teachers tell me that um, they uh, didn't want to come to school because of this one student. You know how this goes. This is true. This like eats at us. So we have one student that's been really hard. So Cammie is, um, shows up first day loud. She is working the room and she is um, angry and she is, um, uh, I don't know what's happening in her life, but she looks like she could be 20 right now. Um, and she's in the seventh grade. And so she's working the room and I realize it pretty quickly. And, um, and I'm constantly going, Hey, what's happening. Um, and then, you know, from day one, the, I, we haven't rolled out tools, not rules with my whole school yet this, this year in advisory, um, which we do do. Um, so this, some of the kids are familiar with the language from sixth grade, um, but I just hop right in and I'm like, I get the honesty piece really nailed in, like in the first couple minutes. In this class, we get to be honest. You get to tell me exactly why you're doing what you're doing. And I'm going to, I'm going to hear it and I'm going to help you take care of those behaviors. So I, I kind of nailed that down. Tammy's kind of working the room and she's doing it every single day, popping off. And I'm constantly going, okay, I need honesty. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And, um, and yesterday she was, or in Thursday, on Thursday, she was in my advisory class and again, pop in her mouth, but I am constantly trying to create an, a place of honesty, trying to create connection. I get her on a star chart really early. And um, that's one of the tools we use for our hardest kids. So I already have eight kids on these star charts where I just tell them I'm going to only notice good things. So Cammie's on one. Um, and yesterday, or in advisory, I started asking about, oh, I was sharing about a book, and I was saying, you know, these kids keep lying, and they've got themselves in hot water, and I said, you know when inside yourself, you um, you uh, keep keep lying, but you feel kind of sick about it, and Cammie said, Miss Moyer, I don't feel sick when I lie. I don't feel sick, and I lie all the time, and I was like, Cammie, that is amazing. You know that about yourself. It's so powerful. And I said, it's not where we want you to be, but I need you to know it's such an important thing you know about yourself. We want you to inside know that feels bad. So I want you to know that was kind of like just a mis general massaging that took place for about, uh, you know, the, those two weeks. Um, and she, she felt safe enough to say that to me. And isn't that so important because she is going to try to lie so many times to me this year, but she already knows. I know that. And I, and I, I praised her for that. The second situation I want to share is with a student named David. Um, David is on everyone's radar. He was last year. Also, I have him in advisory and in English. And he walked into advisory after being suspended the first week. I'm not sure what happened, but he had been suspended. And he walks into advisory late with a buddy. And they've got he's got a two liter uh, bottle of Pepsi. And three quarters of it is um, is already um, missing since, nine, and it's nine o'clock in the morning. And he seems like he's on speed. Sometimes, you know, when your kids come into your class and they're juiced up, it feels like they're out of their heads. And he is, and I don't know if he has ADHD. I'm not sure what's happening yet, but... Um, I was super angry. I was like, you, he is blowing up my class. And I say, he walks right up to me because you have to shake my hand to get in my class or I, I mark you absent. So he gave me a handshake and I, you know, super happy to see you, David. Glad you're here. And he said, I, um, and I said, I need you to give me that bottle of Pepsi. You, you only drink water in my class. And he's, and he took, takes off a lid and drinks it right in front of my face. And so I uh, I called the office and I said, I need David out of here for five minutes and then I need him back because I need to have this conversation with him. So they took him out, walked him around the building, calmed him down, got him back in class. And so I could then say, hey, David, you know, kids are working on something. Hey, David, I need to talk to you out in the hallway. And so we have these big Tools Not Rules posters in the uh, in our classroom. But they're also taped outside of a lot of teachers' doors, small, just so we can have these individual conversations. So I said to David, hey, uh, what do I love more than anything? Um, honesty, that's where I always start. I always start. What do I love more than anything? And I always say this. Uh, we don't uh, think our way to honesty. We feel it. We don't noodle our way to honesty. What does a teacher want? To what do they want me to say? I say we feel it. So I often have them, put, have them put their hand on their chest. And I say, okay, you ready for honesty? Okay, you ready, David? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And I said, tell me where you're operating from. Tell me. Look at these words right here. And he had obviously have been taught the words before in the in in sixth grade because he said uh, silly and showboating. I'm like, that's amazing. That is amazing. You know that about yourself. That is absolutely what I see too. That's great. 
Again, we never identify it for them. We let them identify it because sometimes really there's colors of behaviors in different words that we don't always see. So, and then I said to him, How, how's this going at home? And he said, oh, not good. My parents really get mad at me, but they don't like it when teachers are disrespectful to me. And I said, um, how do you feel about this class so far? And he says, oh no, I can tell you care about me. So I, I'm listening, what? And um, and then, you know, I uh, I could just kind of carry on with this, this moment. Oh, and the other thing I said to him is, hey, tell me when this started. Because that's the other thing as teachers is we often take it so personally, like it's some personal affront to us. And I said, um, tell me when this started. And he said, fourth grade. I started hating school fourth grade. I'm like, I'm so sorry. That must be really hard to always be up against teachers. And he said, yep, it is really hard. So, so I want you to know, we go back in the classroom, I get them on a star chart and, and, and star charts are only for me saying positive things. And it's really about the teacher putting themselves on a star chart. So you change the conversation for a kid who only hears one thing all the time. Even if you think you're being kind in your redirections, it can't be about redirections. It has to be, I saw you, you know, be polite to that student. I loved how you shook my hand, just positives. It forces a different connection. And the kids start working. So I want to tell you, Cammie and David both are tough kids. They are overly mature. One of them looks like they're 20. One of them looks like they, they don't want to go to a, a school a day in their life, but they I still look at them and I whisper, you only need two more. You, only, you already have five stars. And they are interested. They go and they choose a prize. And um, other kids are thrilled because they see you trying to do something different uh, for these kids. Um, and they're very, other kids are understanding because I said, hey, have you ever noticed Cammy and David struggle in class? Yes. And I said, we're trying to do something differently. So I wanted to just share those few things. I don't know if Claudia, you can, you want to kind of talk about that, but those are two real things. These are two real kids that are um, uh, highly challenged and highly challenging that make you want to quit your job if you don't know how to approach it. So anyhow. I just think I think what but what both Marlene and I find out when we were when we're working with students, it is so it's so great uh, for our parasympathetic nervous system to know how you're going to enter that conversation. Like there is no moment of, oh, my gosh, you know, what do I do? It's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what I'm doing here. And you just move into it and you often are so surprised by what they say so surprised. And um, you get this moment of, um, of, of hearing from the student and the outcome is often connection, which is amazing. So the outcome is I trust you, like you heard Marlene say, or um, you just feel this connection with them because you heard something that was honest and you had that moment to share. So um, the other, just the other piece is I don't need to decide how I'm going to approach this because I already know because it's already set up in the classroom. And the other students also know what's happening. So there's not this random treatment for this person and then this person gets this and this person gets this. Everybody gets the same treatment. Treatment. Everyone is asked to be honest. Everyone is asked to identify behaviors. And um, that creates a safe environment. We talk a lot about safe environments. We talk a lot about traumatized students who, who are watching and kind of triggered by certain things, but they see you helping other students in this way. And it is safe for the teacher. It's safe for the students as well. Um, yeah, so thanks for sharing those. Um, these are just, this is just some language that um, you might just try <laughs> um, on Monday with your students. So um, for example, like we talked about the magic fuzzy numbers, but this is just a statement that you can make. 42% of us all have our books out and reading, 65 awesome. I think we modeled that. Um, and then there's this piece too, that you can pick out stuff that they are doing well and then, and then label it. This means you're serious. This means you're working. This means you are assertive. And that just helps keep them on track when they keep hearing those cues that, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Um, you can praise the individual, which we've talked about. You can walk up to them. You can say that to them. You can call their parents. I mean, this is really great. Like you call their parents and said, and tell them your child was really assertive today. This is what they did. And often those students who never get good news home, it's, it's a really, it's an honest reflection. Um, 
you can correct the whole group like Marlene said. Everybody stop, look at the posters, talk to your neighbor, what's happening, where do you need to move? Okay, let's get working. Um, and then you can have that private conversation with individuals. Um, Yes, like, you know, so you just say, you kind of get the class going, you get them working, and then you just walk up to them and go, hey, could you come outside with me for a sec? And then you have the quick intervention um, conversation, get them settled, get them what they need, and then get them back working. So they're different. There's a lot of ways that you can use this language and um, put these in the classroom. Okay. Let's talk about how you can teach the students the language. Okay, so we're going to, <laughs> all right, so I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen, and this is kind of funny. This is what we ask the students to do. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and if you're willing, could you turn on your screen and then just act like a shirking student in your classroom? Can you show us what they look like when they're shirking? And shirking and they don't on do anything? Yeah, and what? shirking shirking means like uh, I'm not gonna do it. Some people are like, I still don't know what shirking is. Shirking is like I see what you're asking me, and I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. So look at Heather. Look at Bridget. <laughs> you know, arms it's, crossed. Like, uh, Larry looks yes, like he's look at uh, his Kelly's feet. on her phone. <laughs> Kelly, get off her phone. <laughs> Shauna and Leslie, nice. I love that picture, Liza. Look at what she's doing. <laughs> I'm just gonna do this weird thing. And Liza's like, I'm not doing it. It's like, mm -mm, I'm not, it's not happening. I'm just not doing it. And that is what we see, right? Nice. Yeah. So we have. We, it's fun to act these things out with the students. <laughs> we have them do a lot of skits. We have them. Um, we just do some different things with them, so they all know what it looks like. We. Um, yeah, there's also the great nurse escape, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so the next thing is um, showboating. So showboating are those students who want you to know that they're really smart and what you're teaching is not um, up to their level or they don't believe it is or they want that attention. So um, what are showboaters look like? Can anyone act that one out? Oh, yes, Heather. Heather, could you put your hand down? <laughs> <laughs> What else do our show voters do? Anyone think of something? You can put it in the chat too. Um, what do show voters do that drive us crazy? What do they say? There's lots of interrupting, right? There's lots yeah. of interrupting, lots of getting attention. A lot of times what's interesting for me about showboating is um, kids when they're aggressive also say it's showboating. So that's a way to like just be loud and... Yeah, easy. People are putting in the chat, they interrupt. Um, this is super easy. That's what I was going to say. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Announce how easy it is. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. You know, and then before you even start. So that's that's that showboating behavior that is just so uh, disruptive um, and hard on them. Excessive verbal responses. Yes, literally swanning the room i love that swan, <laughs> exactly like what they're beautiful doing. swan or they're sleeping because they've done it all so why should they bother to even approach what you're doing yes yes exactly so you can see both of those um those are kind of the ends of the spectrum uh the shirking is really disruptive and um and pulls down the learning um and showboating does the same thing and you know when you have a classroom that includes those behaviors it is really hard for the the students who want to work to kind of not be distracted by this other behavior and it, it hurts the social environment as well so we want to coach those kids to get working we need you to get working um so one of the things that we do is we um ask the students what it looks like when they're doing these things um which we've kind of already done because you showed it to me um so we get these lists going in the classroom. So you can see it on the screen. And often we just ask the students, what does it look like when you're shirking? You're laying down, you are, what else were people were doing? They were on their phone. Arms crossed. 
Yep. Arms crossed. And a lot of times we talk about it in we language. So instead of like uh, kind of, so we try to break them out of that fixed mindset thing because they're sometimes afraid to say they've done these things. So we just say, what do we do as human beings? What do human beings do when we're shirking? What do we do when we're showboating? Versus, yeah, well, some kids in the class always are shirking because, and so you kind of move out of that kind of tattletale or like, um, um, kind of, you know, just, just what is it we do? What do we do? Cause we've all, yeah. we've all had hard behaviors before. And Marlene and I have done this for years and years with all sorts of students, all ages of students, and they will all make this list. And it's kind of fun. We're just like, what else? What else? What else do they do? And they come up with everything that's happening in the classroom that's shirking. Same thing with showboating. They, they will say the same things. People raise their hand, you know, we're calling out, we're not wanting to start. We're um, saying we already have it finished. Like we, they get all the showboating. Um, so you just write all those behaviors down and a chart like this, like when we did it, we literally did it on chart paper. Just write them all down. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And then here, this working place is really your gold tick, golden ticket. Because then we say, what does it look like when we're working? And they'll say things like, uh, you have your pencil, you have your supplies, you're talking quietly with your group, like all those things you've been telling them all year, like what you want and what they have learned. So they tell you what it looks like when they're working. And the reason why I'm saying that's the golden ticket is we've talked about the magic fuzzy numbers. We've talked about praise. When you see these behaviors that they said was working, that is when you praise them. So you, so I might say, Everybody, this is amazing. A hundred percent of us um, are all um, on the third, uh, over a hundred percent of us have already started, I shouldn't say that, like a hundred percent of us um, have their papers out and we've already started working on the first problem. I see people reading it and I see people doing a great job. And then you tell them, because you told me that what working looks like is when we get started on our paper right away, that's working. Thank you so much. So we're thanking them for something that they told us that working was it's their words, it's their language. And you can just, you immediately just give them praise for that. So that's how they learn to understand what working looks like, how they get coached into that piece. And, and all praise is now around this language. So we're never just saying like, oh, Claudia, you're such an amazing student and human being. It's like, oh, I see lots. So we really try to pull names out of the conversation. And everyone's just kind of making these micro adjustments to make it happen because they're not sure who's not. They're not sure who is. And they all um, know what it looks like to be on track. Yeah. And um, the next thing that we do that's really important as well, um, and if we have more time with you, we illustrate this, but do this in your classroom. If you want to do like shirking, working, showboating, take the, take the time to do this and ask them why. Why do students do this? And, and this is where we develop that empathy um, and, and, and for sure cue them to say, we do this. Like we shirk and the things that they will be honest about are wonderful. Like we shirk when we're afraid. We shirk when we are don't want anyone to know we don't know how to do it. We shirk when we don't understand. So then you get the real thing that the students are trying to show you with the behavior. So you get this insider information underneath. We shirk when our um, group is mean to us. We shirk when we have had a really bad day at home. Like, so then we develop that empathy for there are reasons why we are shirking. And, and, and we need to know that the behaviors, just the communication for the underlying um, thing that's happening. They'll say the same thing about showboating. Why, do, why are we showboating? Um, and they'll say really interesting things. One of the most interesting things I heard a fourth grader say is we're showboating because we think it's going to make students, kids like us because at recess, it's really hard to find someone to play with. And, and this child was a showboater and was using that to try and get attention. Um, and I was like, that's really interesting. This behavior is telling me you need some support at recess and you need some support with those behaviors because it's making kids not like you um, or be in your want to be in your group, you know, so so take the time to do this um, piece as well. And Claudia, I just want to point out, we have four minutes. I don't know if you want oh. to move um, to um, just some questions or just highlight Let's one just of the things from the study. Okay. Uh, here's what we can talk I was about. thinking we had till 2.05. Oh, is, is, is it? Am I wrong? Maybe. Oh, here too. 
it's too good. So, and I just want to say from the study, we found out that teachers feel more supported and kids feel happier and they work harder in classes that use this language because they think kids, they think teachers really want you to ask for help. And most of the time we ask them if they want for help and we sit and say, well, no one asked for help. And what do you mean you need help? They, it's the language that helps them think, oh, she really wants us to ask for help when we need it. So, um, so Claudia, you want to just finish this up and maybe, I don't know if people have questions or. Yeah. And I see a question in the chat. So Marlene, if you'll field questions, I'm going to put the link to the slideshow in okay. the chat. Okay. Um, and also one thing to know is we um, we do have a website and it's at the it's on the last slide. And if you want to contact us or you have any questions, um, you can contact us there. So let's open it up for questions while I create the link. Yeah, so she is creating the the copy. Um, yes, thank you for um, showing some gratitude. Hopefully you got one thing out of it. That would be awesome. Um, yes, it is a great tool to use in the middle of the year when things are going off course and you need help. Um, yeah, and I'm going to put in our website. Um, okay. While, while they're giving you more resources with our two minutes, I'm going to remind you to fill out the survey, complete the attendance. Um, that is also in the chat, that link. And I'm going to make two general service announcements for the good of Nevada teachers. Um, give me one second to share my screen, hopefully. Um, if you haven't, you're actually in an elementary math room, even though this topic wasn't necessarily about mathematics. So if you are not uh, familiar with the Nevada Mathematics Education Leadership Council, uh, and you are somebody who teaches math, well, we hope you take a time to look at this website. It's relatively new. It's a Nevada affiliate of the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, which we've never had an affiliate before in Nevada. So that's big news for us. Um, the other general, general announcement is that the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching the, the nomination period is currently open for teachers that are grades K through six. So if you know a grades K through six teacher that really excels at teaching math, science, computer science, or engineering, please, please nominate them today. Um, give them the honor of a nomination. The nomination window is open until January 8th, but sooner is much better than later because as soon as they are nominated, they can start working on their application. So give them the gift of time by nominating them now, not in Jan on January 7th, so that they have ample time to consider competing. Um, if you are that excellent teacher, K-6 this year, just click begin an application. Don't wait for a nomination. Um, this is your chance where I want you to show both. Please, please acknowledge your excellence in your classroom and consider competing. Winners, you get a trip to Washington, D.C. and $10,000 cash prize for you. Um, so those are my those are my general service announcements. And I want to thank everyone for being here, particularly our presenters who joined us on uh, Saturday. Thank you for sharing your experiences and expertise. Thank you, Heather. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you.